thank God for that. If you would, turn your Bibles to Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. We'll not spend, of course, uh, a lot of time tonight just due to the circumstances and the weather, but I do appreciate those of you that came out tonight. This is a wonderful crowd, and uh, those that are not able, uh, thank you for tuning in uh, for tonight's Bible study. And again, uh, don't forget about uh, services on Sunday morning and, and uh, 8.30, and then again at 11, and Sunday classes at 10 o'clock. And looking forward to that. Looking forward to some warmer weather as well. Amen. And uh, Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 7. Last week, if you remember, we left off uh, on the uh, verse number 6. We were talking about, if you go back to Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 6, the Bible says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth any time, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. We left off there last, last week talking about our production. What does our faith produce? Well, faith produces works. And we can know that according to James chapter 2 verse 18 and uh, other verses that we can uh, refer to, the book of Ephesians. But then if we go to uh, Galatians chapter 5 and we look at verse number 7, uh, Paul asks an important question there. He says in verse 7, You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be, uh, ye be none other wise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? This is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we have this evening. And I pray, Lord, that you'll bless every word, everything that is said and done. May it honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. We see in verse 7 uh, a powerful lesson. Uh, Paul asked a question. He said, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Here's one of uh, Paul's favorite metaphors, if you will. Uh, he likens the Christian life to a race, and I believe that would be very accurate today. And Paul uses the same analogy in, in the book of Philippians. Over in Philippians chapter 3, verse number 14, he says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul reminds this Galatian church that they once at some time in their life was running well. They were doing good. You did run well. He said at one time you were running at a very good pace, at a very good... You know, the Christian life is about pace. It's about pacing yourself. It's not a sprint. It's not running off in how you start. It's really how you finish. And, and when we finish, we've paced ourselves. I believe that's why I don't believe a whole lot in, in spiritual burnout. But, but I do believe people sometimes do not pace themselves and they fail to finish the race the way they started the race. So we see here that Paul refers to that. and Paul reminds them that they once ran well. They were on track with their eyes. They were pressing toward the mark. They were running the race well. They had their eyes on the goal and committed to finishing the race. And by the way, I believe that, I believe that a lot, most people, if not all people, that come to church and get saved and, and start growing the Lord and all that, I believe they're, they would love to stay that way. I believe everyone would say, yeah, this is great. I love the Christian life. This is wonderful. And boy, they start out. You ever seen somebody start out the race well and they get saved? And buddy, I mean, they attend everything. I mean, they're there when the doors are up. They're there when there's ice on the roads. Amen. They're there when it's uh, cold outside. They're there when uh, snow's falling. They're there when it's blistering hot. They're there all the time. They're faithful but where do you find them a couple of years from now? You know, what blesses my heart is uh, the fact that we have people in here that's been saved for years and years and years and years and years, and you're still running the race. You know what you've learned to do? You've learned to pace yourself. You've learned to get in the race and stay at a good pace. 
steady yourself. Hey, don't overdo it, but don't underdo it. Amen? And just steady race. And Paul said, you did run well. You kept your eyes on the prize. You, you were committed to finishing the race. But then there's a problem. He says in verse 7, Who did hinder you that you, you should not obey the truth. Notice that word hinder in your Bible in verse 7. It comes from the, the Greek, the, there's a Greek word, anakokto, which means to beat or to drive back. Uh, it is a word that would really be a more of a sports type word or Olympic type phrase that when someone, if you were running the race and someone to maybe run on the track and literally push you off the track, off of your pace, that's uh, it's what Paul's talking about, that word hinder, uh, shove someone off their course. Who Paul asked the question, who shoved you off pace? Who hindered you from what you were doing? What a question. This is exactly what had happened to the church at Galatia. Guess who would side, sideswipe them and knock them off pace? These Judaizers. See, the church at Galatia had been taught that it was the grace... Uh, the grace of God that led to salvation. It was the grace of God. But yet the Judaizers, they taught that it was works. And they were mixing works and grace together. And it literally knocked these Galatian believers off course. And Paul said, who hindered you? I believe he asked the question, but no one the answer. Amen? Uh, Jesus often did that. And these Judaizers had cut in front of them and, and literally had knocked them off course. Notice verse 8. This persuasion, this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. The word persuasion, it, it, it is a word that is used that literally means to abandon the faith. They literally were talked into doing something else. They abandoned what uh, Paul had taught them to do or told them to do. So they were persuaded. It's only used one time in the New Testament. I think that's very interesting. And the one time that the Apostle Paul uses this word... He literally means that the, these Judaizers had talked this Galatian church into doing something that they should not have done. You know, it happens today. It happens to new converts all the time. It happens to folks in the church. They get persuaded. You know who's constantly persuading to do wrong and constantly talking? You know, the, the old devil and his, his crowd. As soon as a person gets saved and gets on track for God, boy, you better look out. Amen. Or maybe someone that was cold and distant and uh, maybe not doing a whole lot for the Lord, but all of a sudden a fire is lit and, buddy, they're on fire for God. Hey, you better watch around the corner because someone's going to be there to hinder you and to persuade you. Amen. They're going to be there. So we see we, have some, uh, we, we see we have some enemies and some folks that would like to knock us off course. But then I want you to notice there's a leaven here. Look at verse number 9. It's a perilous leaven. Because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. This leaven is often used in the Word of God to illustrate corruption. And by the way, it only takes a little leaven to corrupt the whole thing. The Bible says in Matthew thirteen thirty three, another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto leaven, which a woman took and hid three measure of meal, till the whole uh, was leavened. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Leaven in the Bible was illustrated a corrupting influence. And by the way, it only took just a little bit, and that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. Or this uh, false teachers, these Judaizers, is just a little bit of false doctrine, but what does that do to a church? Just a little false doctrine. Just a little change. You know what? If somebody made a change in our Bible, just one change, would it be the, would it be the inerrant, infallible Word of God? No, it's one change. One sin. One little thing, one little spot, one little mark. Hey, the devil knows that many of you tonight that made your way to church tonight and braved the cold, and bra we know that you're not living in some deep sin, at least if you are, uh, then, then you're doing a pretty good job of hiding it. But I'll say this, it, it, it most, he's not going to cause you to fall into that one, but he'd like for you to take just a little. Just a little bit. This leaven is something that... Listen, no amount of heresy should ever be permitted to exist in the local church. None. 
I'm talking about behind this pulpit, but let me say, most people's like, well, bless God, there ain't no heresy behind that pulpit, but there shouldn't be behind any other place in ministry in this place either. I'm talking about to a little Sunday school room. I'm talking about to a, an adult class. I'm talking about in the Spanish. I, I, I don't know what Lazaro's teaching, but I know this. I know that if I found out, and he's a good man, I think he's doctrinally sound, but if I found out that he was teaching something, something we'd, have, we'd have an issue. Because it doesn't matter what language you're speaking, doctrine is doctrine. Bible is Bible. It doesn't matter if it's to young people. It doesn't matter if it's to the elderly. It doesn't matter where it is, on what platform it is. No amount of heresy should exist in uh, the local church. It only takes just a little bit. That's where it starts, just a little. And that leaven is uh, a sign of the uh, sin in the Bible. It's corruption. Then we see these perverted leaders. Look at verses 10 and 11. The Bible says, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be, uh, that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment. Whosoever he be, and I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross see. So Paul had confidence that these Galatian believers would, in fact, finally reject legalism and fully embrace the grace of our Lord. And I believe Paul deep down inside knew that these, these Galatian believers, and he was very optimistic in the fact that they would see the true light, see the truth, and they would believe. Then he said in verse 12, I would that they were even cut off which trouble you. Now this is a powerful verse. He said, I wish they were cut off. Them words cut off, it speaks of literally amputation. I mean, it's the same word as being cut off. It Removal, an infected limb. You go to the doctor and maybe gangrene has set in a leg. If you're not careful, if it's not cut off, if it's not taken care of, that can corrupt your body. It often happens in diabetic patients and different ones. They have to constantly check their feet for... Uh, my dad's a bad diabetic and he has to constantly make sure his, his shoes are not rubbing blisters on his feet. How does often these, uh, they're not getting proper circulation to their feet and infection can set in. And what do they do? When the doctor walks in and says, Sir, if you don't take that foot off, you're going to die. Well, what would you rather do? As bad as I would hate to lose a, an infected limb, Paul says here, I would that they were cut off which trouble you. If it troubles you, it's better for you to go through life and cut that off than to live infected. That's a pretty powerful verse, isn't it? Paul said, I would rather than be cut off from you totally. Let me just tell you this tonight, church. If there's something in your life that is troubling you and hindering you from the preached Word of God or the preached... Uh, power of God or, or service in God or the grace of God, you need to cut it out of your life. Just cut it out. You know, we, we, I'm preaching on the life of Joseph on, on Sunday mornings. And Joseph, uh, we, we remember preaching on battle and bitterness on, on a few, few weeks ago. Uh, this past week on, on tackling temptation. We're going to do part two this week. Often we can conquer temptation and just because you did it one time does not mean that it's not going to be sitting there the next day. And guess what we have to do often? We have to say, you know what? Until I get that rid cut off and get that out of my life, it's going to be there every day. What did Joseph eventually have to do? I'm talking about probably quick. He had to leave Potiphar's house. Now, he, he might have left without his coat, but he did not leave without his character. Amen? She, she got his coat, but she didn't get his character. And let me just tell you this, uh, I would rather something cost me a coat than cost me character. We're going to have to cut some things off. Paul said this idea of removal was an infected, it prohibited further disease. Paul used this word, then I'm, I'm interested. Look at verse number 13, and I'm moving along. We just got a few more minutes. It says in verse 13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but, love, but by love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I've often referred to verse 13 as often probably one of the most misused 
the, the doctrine of grace and the doctrine of Christian liberty is probably misused more than any other doctrine, the doctrine of grace. Because often people focus on the grace of God and what they have done is they've taken Christian liberty and they've turned it into a license to live just about any old way you want to live. And let me just say this, that Christian liberty is not a license to sin, but an opportunity, according to verse number 13, to serve somebody. That's what it reads. Look at it again. It says, Ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. The flesh is not... We know that it, it's not going to serve God. It's not going to do right. But then he gives us the other alternative. But by love serve one another. So what's the Christian life about? It's about serving and living for others. Use not that Christian liberty for an occasion in the flesh. Hey, don't you cater to the, do things that only satisfy this old flesh. Won't you do something that helps somebody else? Boy, isn't that a good verse? Don't use this as an occasion of the flesh. Don't use that. Christian liberty is wonderful. We're free in Christ. I thank God for this. So here's an equation for you, or here's a, here's a, a good way to put it. Liberty plus love equals service to others. Remember that. Liberty plus love equals service to others. But here's the next one. Liberty minus love is a license, equals a license, or slavery to sin. So you either have one of the two. Liberty plus love, service to others, or liberty minus love is equals license to to slavery. So verse 14, For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Let me just tell you, a lot of times people say, well that Old Testament law, it's a, boy it's a heavy one, I don't know if we can keep it. Have you ever looked at the New Testament? Oh yeah, with grace, man. It's a whole lot easier to live under grace, is it? Is it? Love thy neighbor as thyself. How many of you could truly answer that question that you love other people just as much as you love yourself? I tell you, you're talking about convicting. If we truly live in the grace of God, we will love and serve other people. We will forget ourselves, our little kingdom that we established. That oh, if somebody even comes near my little kingdom, uh, I'm gonna. I, it's mine. It's all mine. Well, where is that in the scripture? It's supposed to be others. I mean, we're serving others. It's all about helping others. It's all about uh, you know going and helping other people. It's not about what me, myself, and I and what I can get and what I can. No, it's about helping other people. So the grace of God, Christian liberty, is not about what can I get out of this. It's what can I give out of this. That is it. Verses thirteen and verse fourteen. But then I want you to notice verse 15. It's a very interesting verse. The Bible says, But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed of one another. So Paul, don't get the analogy in your mind that these Galatian church was literally going over and taking a hunk out of each other. Going over and saying, ah, you know, Like a chicken wing, right, Brother Tripp? If it's a chicken wing, I... I might have to take a hunk out of somebody, but lemon pepper, amen. That ain't Paul, they wasn't biting each other. But what Paul was saying in verse 15 is spiritually, but if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one another. I believe there's it, it, Paul switches gears here a little bit and he 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 introduces something he he says that there was a, uh, the clash that takes place when God's people walk in the flesh and say the Spirit. I believe there's something that starts to take place when you start living in the flesh. You literally start devouring each other. Instead of walking in the Spirit and serving one another and living for others in verses 13 and 14, you start biting people with your tongue. and You start taking hunks out of people. And you know, often what's sad is 
often that happens on the premises of spiritual... On, I mean, I'm talking about it happens around the church. You're not... It would be awful to do that to a lost person and talk about them and, and trash them, but friend, it, it's, 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 I think, a thousand times worse to take another fellow believer, a sister or brother in Christ, and just dog them. And, and devour, the Bible says devour. It, that's what happens. Church, look at me. That's what happens when you walk in the flesh instead of walking in the Spirit. We get easily offended. We get easily upset. We get easily bitter. And before you know it, instead of praying and loving our neighbor and forgiving, we just lash back out and we take hunks out of their spirit. Hunks out of their testimony. And boy, we just go after them. And uh, Paul says, this is the way, uh, this is example of God's people walking in the flesh instead of walking in the Spirit. And when the flesh is in control, unity is sacrifice and disruption occurs. Hey, may that not be Bible Baptist Church. Man, uh, I was reading Acts chapter 2 today. And, and, and just uh, in my in study some and looking over the book of Acts, I love especially love that second chapter. But they were all in one accord, in one place. There was none of this. And by the way, just a few verses, cha uh, verse, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, the, the Holy Ghost of God came in and sat down on that place and the power of Pentecost took place, just what we preached about Sunday night. Why did that happen? It created an atmosphere that the Holy Spirit of God could come. He will not come to a church that is devouring each other. He will come to a church that is united in prayer, in purpose, and in power. Amen. So, I, you, listen, we're not all going to be in agreement over everything. But we ought to come together in one purpose, in one mind, and not devour each other and just say, you know what? It's really not my church, it's His church. And you know, sometimes I can get my agenda and my preferences and my opinions, All I can get all that uh, uh, put together and I can get all that in the way of Jesus, in the way of His church, and get all that blinding me. And before you know it, I'm walking in the flesh instead of the Spirit and I'm backbiting and picking people apart and devouring instead of walking in the Spirit and keeping my eyes on the prize. We got to make sure that we're not doing that because this Galatian church, they attempted to satisfy God by works of the flesh in complete disunity and developed a bad attitude and had a bad spirit among them. Their fleshly conduct and desires had been caused, it caused them to turn on one another. A lot of local churches are like that today. It's, it's kind of like the traffic jam that you see on 385 occasionally, amen? Or on 85 all the time. And you see that traffic jam. And you, if you'll roll your window down, you'll hear the horns beeping. You'll hear, you'll see this from time to time. What's your problem, man? You, you cut me off. And then you see other things. You're told you're number one often. Everyone's hollering at each other, bad attitudes and things happen. It's like a traffic jam. Nothing good can come out of this when the flesh is not. You know, when you're walking in the Spirit, things are flowing. Boy, it's just free. You're free. And Boy, when you're walking in the flesh, there's contention. There's all kinds of problems. Before you know it, you're... Ain't nothing moving. Ain't nothing working. You ever been to a local church? Hey, I, I've been in church before where things were so kinked up and jammed up and it was cold as ice. And I'm talking about you could ice skate down the center aisle and it was just dead and uh, be, just, uh, just bound. I want something free. Amen? I want to come into a church service where you might have a little, maybe just a little order of service or something, and, and all of a sudden God blows in there and you just take that thing and put it in your Bible and say, well, we're just going to let the Holy Spirit of God take over the service. I like it when it happens. It, it can happen every service. It, it, listen, it shouldn't be up to me, uh, but we shouldn't be binding uh, the Spirit or binding the Spirit of God. Paul uses these words. Bite and devour in verse number 15. And he describes this Galatian treatment of one another. A people who are above all others should understand and practice the love of God. I believe that. And then lastly, 
and uh, verse number 16, the Bible says, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Here we see kind of a sharp contrast between the walking in the Spirit in the same verse and the fulfilling of the lust of the flesh. It's important to understand the teaching of God's Word when we read these verses and concerning these two natures. And I believe next week, I'll save this for next week, about the two natures that we have. We have a depraved nature, the old man's what the Bible says. Then we have a divine nature, which is the new man. There's two natures, and guess what, church? Look at me. They're constantly at war with each other. That old man has not been saved. The new man is the Spirit of God. We've been birthed. We've been born again. Born of the Spirit. So that's the Holy Spirit of God. He indwells a believer, that new man. But that's why we have to crucify the old man daily. They're at war with each other, contrary one to another. God saves us. He does not eradicate the old, depraved nature that we have, which we receive at our natural birth, whenever your birth was. That old nature that we have, we were birthed with the first time. That's the old man. God does, however, impart to the believer an absolute new nature, which is born of the Holy Spirit of God at the second birth. Amen? And that's the day you got saved. But those two natures are going to be constantly at war with each other. Constantly. That's why Paul says, I die daily. I have to crucify. Put that old flesh up on the cross. Crucify it. Get it out. Cut it off. In order to walk in the Spirit of God. Next week we'll talk about those two natures, the divine nature and the depraved nature that we all battle. And uh, I think uh, we can learn some things tonight. I appreciate you being here tonight. And uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, then I want you to be safe. Please be safe going home tonight. And uh, be ready and prayed up for Sunday. And uh, be ready to be here and serve the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house tonight. Thank you, Lord, for these faithful, faithful folks. All the ones that, uh, Lord, could not make it tonight, I understand. I understand, Lord, that uh, uh, tonight it was not very favorable weather at all. And, uh, Lord, we just ask that you would give protection to these that did, did come out tonight. Lord, uh, protect their vehicles on the road. And then, Lord, the others that are on the road tonight, I, I pray you be with them. Lord, we love you. We thank you for Calvary. We thank you, Lord, that, uh, Lord, we were born uh, of the Spirit of God. And, Lord, I pray that we'll walk in the Spirit. And, Lord, not devour and bite and backbite and fight amongst each other, but, God, that we will be a new creature in Christ and that we will walk in the Spirit and not grieve the Spirit and love one another. Lord, let us have unity. Uh, continue to have unity here in our church. We love you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.